Welcome back to OAG's first uh, webinar of 2021. I'm Becca Rowland. Um, I'm a partner at Midas Aviation and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon's webinar. It feels like a long time since we uh, last did a webinar. It was December, six weeks ago, in fact. Um, six weeks can be a long time in aviation. And um, as we started 2021, I guess there was a lot of hope that we'd turn a corner, that the market might improve, we'd see some more positive signs. But I, I'm not sure, as, as we're going to look at the data later, that an awful lot has changed in that six weeks. Um, and it's going to be a bit of a tough start for uh, our year in, in, uh, in aviation. Um, I'm very aware that last time I hosted was in November, which was the day of the uh, US election, and today we've got the US inauguration. So uh, welcome in particular to any US um, uh, people listening. Uh, thanks for joining us today. On, uh, uh, we're aware that you could be watching the TV or, or being somewhere else. Um, uh, quite a, an eventful day today. Anyway, it's great to have uh, our a panel with us. Uh, it's uh, an um, as usual, we've got John Grant, Senior Analyst at OEG, who brings a wealth of experience across the industry and is uh, never short of things to say. Welcome, John. Hi. Um, and joining John today, we've also got Eddie and Sid from Ishka, who uh, Eddie's been on one of our webinars before. Um, Ishka has huge amounts of data and information about uh, the world of aircraft transactions and leasing and uh, just provide a lot more research and analysis that we're going to be drawing on uh, later this afternoon. Uh, welcome, Eddie and Sid. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, the title we've taken for today's webinar is Taking Stock, Prospects for the World's Airlines in 2021. And we're taking advantage both of the fact that we've been talking a lot about vaccine stocks, um, who's got vaccines, how it's being rolled out, what difference it's going to be making, um, but also looking at airline stock prices um, seeing if that tells us a slightly different picture to what we normally look at with capacity um, about how the market is, is viewing airlines, is there confidence perhaps where the, uh, the capacity numbers uh, depress us a little bit. So we're going to be looking at each of those things, but um, we're going to start as usual by looking at the latest frequency and capacity position for the world's airlines and, and aviation in general. So um, let me bring John in at this point. This is uh, data we uh, usually start our webinars with. Uh, in this instance, we've got uh, 12 months of rolling data at the top and then the last eight weeks in the bottom. So the key number in a way is this latest week, week of 18th of January, we're seeing globally uh, scheduled seats are now at 47% below where they were a year ago. This isn't really where we hope to be, is it, John? Uh, certainly isn't, Becca. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is actually the 52nd week that we have been tracking uh, the impact of COVID-19. So we should be getting a couple of birthday candles out and celebrating, but there's nothing much to celebrate here. Um, we, I think at the end of November, Becca, and uh, into December, our expectation was that it would be a a tough couple of quarters for the industry and that there really wasn't much optimism or hope of any recovery um, during certainly the first quarter and and into the second quarter but what we're actually seeing is a couple of steps backwards um, with most markets seeing some reduction in capacity as more lockdowns um, new spikes of covid uh, occur and governments and regulators take actions that uh, to some people seem completely disproportionate to um, the impact of the initial spike. So it's it's extremely frustrating. And, and when you look at these numbers, uh, you just you just see that we're treading sand. Um, we're not making any great steps forward. When we do take a step forward, uh, we suddenly go back. And if you look at Europe, for example, uh, the week of Christmas, we had a bit of a bit of a Christmas present, and capacity uh, was only down 61%, and it's now down at 73% compared to the same time last year. So um, it's it's depressing, and it, it's easy to get caught up in that depression. But we've got to remember, you know, this has always and will be a year of two halves, and if the airlines can go in at half time just one nil down, um, mm -hmm. then they'll 
probably be doing a lot better than Chelsea did last night. So uh, um, yeah, I knew you'd get football uh, examples in at some point. There you go. So on that ba on that basis, um, you know, we've just got to hold on and hold our nerve um, and get as much support and minimise the losses as as much as we can. So, so John, for me as a sort of data person, I obviously like this sort of data because it's about benchmarking and seeing where we are and tracking performance. But as I was putting these numbers together, I was really challenged about whether by comparing where we were a year ago, where we are now to where we were a year ago, are we just encouraging people to think things will go back to a point we used to know? And, and actually, we need to be much more focused on uh, this is how things are now and, and what has to happen going forward. This is our new baseline. It's not a 2019 or early 2020 baseline. We should be be taking action as if as if everything has changed. And it has. And you're absolutely right. This this is the baseline. We of course haven't touched upon the fact that these are capacity levels and we know demand is even softer than capacity. So you know demand is lagging anywhere between 20 and 30% in terms of um, capacity. Uh, we're hearing stories of, of extremely um, lightly loaded aircraft. And of course, the recovery is um, not gonna be um, a rapid exponential um, line. It uh, will have bumps, um, it, will, it will slow down. And certainly when you think about where we are now, the anticipated recovery is probably more towards quarter four of 2021 than Q3. And of course, then we, we hit the Northern Hemisphere winter season uh, when demand is traditionally at its softest points anyway. So um, this is this is gonna be really tough for the airline because if they, if they can only have three months of relatively good performance in 2021, you know, they're still gonna be carrying a lot of uh, liability um, and uh, cost forward into 2022. So this is this is a fragile recovery, and airlines are going to have to manage their way through this very carefully uh, to be able to um, to grow out uh, when the timing is right. That's uh, it's very sobering that I you know I remember when we were talking last April May, hoping that a summer season would come back, and the thought that we might go two years without a, a decent summer season is is quite tough. Let's, um, let's move on and have a look at some individual countries. Um, we've got the same top row as the global numbers by for the last eight weeks, and then we've got a number of countries. Um, China, which has been our sort of um, positive uh, story, has, has, has taken a bit of a dive here, hasn't it? What is happening with China? Uh, it's called COVID. Um, you may have heard of it last year. Um, mm -hmm. They they are very um, ruthless in terms of when they see a spike or an outbreak, you know, we, we see the stories in the press about uh, lockdowns um, of cities with populations of up to 11 million people and capacity gets cut overnight. Now, um, we've seen that and um, perhaps the more worrying element in China is that we're three weeks away from New Year and the traditional um, festivals and celebrations and the strong domestic demand. And the authorities are already cautioning people about the need to travel back home over Chinese New Year um, and run the risk of uh, infection and, and spreading uh, the virus. So um, it, is, it is a soft period and it's, um, it just demonstrates, Becca, that every market will have a bumpy return and a recovery. Um, we, we also have to be aware, don't we, of, of the sort of the granularity within these numbers, that there's different stories taking place at the same time. And I'd like to bring Sid in at this point, because Sid, you were saying, you know, it's not a consistent story in China that carries like Spring Airlines are, are actually outperforming the others. Yeah, it just shows, uh, shows the potential of, of that LCC segment in the country. So the full service carriers, if, if you look at the domestic numbers for November and uh, December, it's it's as as John mentioned, it's 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 kind of trended downwards. Uh, but but uh, but yeah, spring has continued on an on, on a year on year basis to uh, to grow. And 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 by I mean uh, uh, pre in previous months it it was qu quite uh, quite a strong uh, 
almost 50% growth rate so so it just uh, shows the variation even even within that market but but yeah this new wave of uh, uh, infections and and these kind of follow on uh, restriction that that is a bit concerning as as we go into the traditionally strong holiday period and it's it's kind of a similar story in um, in some of the other major markets as well yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? We've said all along that amongst all the sort of bad news, there are airlines um, finding opportunities out there, aren't there? John, there are. And, you know, some, markets, yeah. some, some markets, Becca, such as Mexico, continue to perform relatively well. But, you know, when I, when I look at this chart and I see Germany, Singapore and the United Kingdom, all with less than 20% of their normal or the capacity yeah. they had this time last year, you know these are these are three powerhouses of the aviation industry in terms of capacity um business travel um and they're languishing um so far behind um and with certainly in the case of the united kingdom and germany no real optimism that that is going to improve before the end of march um jet 2 in the united kingdom have essentially suspended all services until the end of March, Ryanair are operating less than 10% of their normal capacity. Singapore Airlines less than 10% of their capacity. You know, it's um, it's it's a difficult picture to to accept. And that recovery, when it does occur, you know, we've got to remember it's coming from a long, long way behind, um, and it's got a lot of growth that it's got to accommodate. Yeah, well, well, well said, John. Let's um, we'll move on to have a look at capacity in the next few weeks now. But if you've got questions, if things that Sid, Eddie, uh, and John are are saying prompt questions, do use the uh, function to ask your questions. We'll try and take some of those questions as we go through, and if we have time, we'll uh, take some of them at the end. So this is a, a chart in the style we've shown a number of times before, where we take a snapshot of where the capacity was that airlines were putting out there um, currently, which is the yellow line, and then at various points in the past. So we've got three points two weeks apart here. Um, so the lighter gray line was two weeks ago. And what we show, this area between the, the lines effectively is, is 60, almost 60 million seats that have come out uh, between now and the end of March that have come out of the market over the last two weeks. Um, the airlines are still adjusting capacity short, close close to when they're going to fly, aren't they, John? They are. Um, I I think that gap you're referring to really, Becca, should be referred to as a cloud cuckoo land. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, because yeah, there's just... tell me that it should be down here, shouldn't it? This absolutely there is, you know, um, I would challenge anyone um, to have any confidence or give any solid set of reasons as to why that is going to improve from around the 50 million mark per week between now and the end of March. Um, you know, there's plenty of capacity out there. There's very little demand um, and airlines have got to bunker down and get through these next couple of months uh, and weeks. Um, and that that is, you know, that's creating or allowing the behavior we saw before um, Christmas to uh, to continue where airlines are between six and two weeks before um, operation taking out um, significant amounts of capacity. I know when we looked at this um, yesterday we I, I guess we just assumed that a lot of that capacity coming out was in Europe. We're based in Europe. We can see the lockdowns happening. We know that we can barely travel outside, you know, our homes at the moment. But but actually, when we looked at the data, more of it was coming out in North America and Asia than in Europe. So it's it's everywhere, isn't it? This is affecting airlines everywhere. This it is, and um, you know, we've we've seen um, some governments in Europe um, completely black banned um, any air services from South America and Latin America in the last week. Um, and this is the, what, the thing about COVID-19 and its impact on this industry is that, you know, it is impacting different markets at different times and everyone has been affected. This is not an Ebola that hits West Africa, uh, an Asian flu that hits Hong Kong. This is, you know, this is the, a global incident. Um, the magnitude of which we've never seen before and hopefully we'll never see again. Okay, let's um, let's move on and um, 
hopefully, you know, we, we're all, lots of us are looking for the vaccine to, to, to at least begin, be the beginning of the end of this. It, it should make a difference. Um, how soon it'll make a difference, it, it's, we're still waiting to see. The, this chart comes from our world in data, um, and I think the same data is available elsewhere. Just shows how the vaccine is being rolled out and the proportion of different populations that have had it so far. Really, it's just a handful of countries still that have got any any penetration of, of, of vaccines in their population at the moment. But but some nice steep upward curves there. Um, how much is the vaccine going to make a difference? Um, it's going to make a difference to you, Becca, because you know when you get to that time in life um, and you need the vaccine. Um, but... I'm, I'm not in a high priority uh, age group yet, John. Thank you. Right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but more seriously, this is um, the vaccine is just one element in a much wider set of steps that the industry needs to take um, to overcome uh, the, the frustrations of COVID-19. You know, the vaccine is great and it's extremely useful, but it has to be um, implemented and, and rolled out um, from a travel perspective and, and aligned with things such as travel pros, uh, passports, um, common travel protocol between countries rather than unilateral actions. Um, and it's it's just one step. And, you know, many of those countries are prioritising um, parts of their community that perhaps do not have a high propensity to travel anyway, um, mm -hmm. because you've got to protect the elderly first. Uh, so it's... Um, it's not an overnight solution and anyone who's hanging on to this thinking that it's um, going to make a dramatic difference in the next six months or even nine months um, perhaps needs to reassess uh, the other factors that still need to be worked on to create um, more traveller confidence and reassurance in the market. Yeah, and, and I guess when we're talking about that, we're often talking about international travel, aren't we? Because that's that's where the restrictions are. But you know, we, we were looking at some data earlier with one of the airlines reporting, you know, they report flights that are domestic where they've had um, cases of COVID. And uh, actually, I was I was quite surprised and thought, well, I, maybe maybe I wouldn't want to fly if I had the, even if I had the chance. Um, you know, that COVID can can be with passengers on any sort of flight, can't it? COVID doesn't discriminate between a domestic flight and an international flight. You don't, COVID doesn't need to show its passport to travel. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to accept that we've got to take all of these steps and be completely vigilant and rigorous um, at all times to, to make sure that we're doing the deep cleaning of the aircraft, the social distancing is in place where possible, that we're wearing the right PPE on the aircraft. Um, and vaccine, I go back to vaccines is just one element of this this whole mm -hmm. process. You know, travel is going to be very different. And as uh, Bernard Lavelle points out, you know, the new variants may not even, uh, the new variants of COVID might not even be um, impacted by uh, the vaccines that we've created to date. So um, I think when anyone is booking travel now, they have to accept and realise they're probably going to have to have a vaccinate, require a vaccination and a pre-travel test uh, before they will be allowed on an aircraft. Uh, that is going to be the new normal uh, for the next couple of years, at least until we get global herd immunity, if we ever do. And, and the next slide we've got here, I, actually, you know, it's quite quite sobering, really. These are This is a survey uh, conducted fairly recently um, by the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, where um, the, the red and yellow are, are people who are saying, proportions of the population saying that they they might not or they definitely wouldn't take the vaccine. So herd immunity is um, is is sort of wishful thinking still, isn't it? If we've got large proportions of the population that actually aren't ever going to take a vaccine anyway. Yeah, um, and you know, to uh, Alan Joyce's comment, the CEO of Qantas, I think it's perfectly reasonable for him to say, um, you know, without a vaccine, you're not travelling on a Qantas flight, but. But I think some of these some of these countries are quite scary, actually, Becca, because both the Germany and the United States, around one third of those people um, who were surveyed, um, and let's assume it's a, a reasonable sample structure, probably will um, not, or definitely will not, um, have the vaccine. Now, um, are they going to be allowed to travel on domestic flights, particularly in the United States? Um, that's 
that's an interesting question, but we've got some very mature, sophisticated markets with a high propensity to fly mm -hmm. where there is significant doubt about the level of um, penetration that the vaccine will achieve. You look at France, 52%, 53%. Um, over half of the population probably not likely to take a vaccine. So all those other measures we're talking about will become, you know, they, we, we mustn't take our eye off the ball about all the other measures in place, must we? And, and, and possibly the need for travel passports of some kind as well. Yeah, and you know, uh, there's an inter there's a question coming from uh, Layla about um, how do you, how will airlines feel about having to check uh, vaccines? Well, if the if the right processes are in place, quite frankly, um, if it means they get a two hundred dollar fare rather than an empty seat. Uh, it's no di no different to checking whether you need a visa to go to China um, or to Saudi Arabia. Um, it will become an accepted part of the travel process, um, and it's just something they will have to do. Yeah, yeah. So before Christmas, um, after the last webinar, we sent a survey to uh, people who uh, were in the webinar participating um, and also to some OEG customers and other contacts. And we've got a couple of slides now with some of those results. Now, this was, I think, before any of the vaccines had been um, given the go ahead to be used. Um, if you're one of those people who filled in the, uh, the survey, thank you very much. Your answers will have been incorporated in some of the slides that you're seeing now. Um, we've got a couple of questions we asked here about vaccines. So will vaccines get people flying? And, and really, no consensus here, I think. You, you know, a lot of people stuck in the middle, some people are out at both ends, very optimistic or, or not at all optimistic. Um, and will vaccinations reach those with the highest propensity to fly? On the whole, not so optimistic, I guess, at the time. And, and still, we're hearing that, you know, that the vaccines are going to the most vulnerable. Though some countries, Indonesia is an example, uh, they're rolling out the vaccine first to working age people um, on the basis that they're out and about in the community, mixing with people and um, then they can go home to their vulnerable people and not, not infect them. So there are different approaches being taken, but on the whole, there is a sense that it's going to be, um, uh, yeah, the, the people who are frequent flyers perhaps will be a bit further down the, down the line for vaccines. Does that all make sense to Eddie, Sid? Does that seem to gel with your understanding of the, I know this area of vaccines isn't, isn't your speciality, but do you have any comments or anything you're hearing about how, how it can make a difference? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a there's a message coming through all all the data so far, really, and as much as you know that the response to the vaccine, the response to the travel restrictions, has all been very fragmented. You know, I mean, people talk Absolutely. of you yeah. know people talk of um, the European Schengen area and domestic China and the US all you know all being the places where we're going to see a resurgence and a, and, a, and the, the recovery faster. And you know, in the US, okay, in domestic China, we've seen that improvement. But in in Europe, you know, and the the, the country by country stats sort of show that as well. There's it's a fragmented approach, and you know, people aren't really working in in unison. And we've seen that with the with the vaccine data as well, in terms of you know which countries and the people who have a who have a desire to be vaccinated, and, and others others less so. And then of course, you know. You know, will it get people flying again? And, and the uncertainty over well, what routes can we can we fly? What where can we go? And the kind of you know regulations at, at either end, you know, origin and destination, it doesn't add up to making life very easy. Um, no, and, and 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 we're still seeing um, a, a lot of changes at very short notice. So you know, people still getting caught out by um, changes in rules about flying that mean they get stuck in another continent, um, and that's that doesn't give anybody confidence to fly. Certainly, you know, anywhere that they can't get get back home by another means other than flying. And it, you know, Becca, it's it, it it's obvious, um, you know, and I understand why it happens, but sometimes um, some of the media perhaps would be better focused on talking about positive steps that are taking place rather than the sensationalism um, of a story. And there was no better example last week than the closing of um, all flights from South America um, to the United Kingdom and a headline from a journalist that said, 
South Americans have been pouring into the United Kingdom in recent weeks. Well, with the greatest of respect, there's only one direct flight a day, um, you know, and it's and it's only got a 20% load factor, and and that sort of sensationalism plastered on a front page of a story um, is really is just not helping everyone's confidence. Um, it might sell it might sell a newspaper, but it doesn't really help the industry. Yeah, yeah. So if um, I think we're agreed that vaccines aren't aren't the single solution, but they they are an enabler. Uh, they're going to take a bit of time to roll out. Um, we had a couple of other questions here that we asked in the survey before Christmas. Governments will rapidly relax international restrictions in air travel uh, when they start rolling out vaccination programs. Were people optimistic or not at all optimistic or extremely optimistic about that? Um, again, sort of the response is centered around the, the middle area here. Um, so, so not really one thing or the other, not optimistic or uh, unoptimistic. And the other question here, countries will work faster to develop an international passport to show travellers have been vaccinated or are safe to fly. There, there was a bit more positivity around this, but you know, we're, we're seeing different initiatives out there. There's still no sort of single initiative, is there? The one I've mentioned here, um, the vaccination credential initiative, it was started by the Commons Project and, and they've brought private sector companies, Microsoft, Oracle on board. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's an IATA, IATA pass as well, isn't there, John? Yeah, that's, they have started some experiments in the United Arab Emirates or trials in the Ar Arab Emirates uh, this week. Um, but, you know, it, it comes to the very heart of this, doesn't it? Throughout the whole 12 months of the pandemic, um, the industry has suffered from a lack of leadership and a cohesive voice that it has put forward. And it's allowed itself to be picked off by individual governments. Um, those same governments who coincidentally are now looking for the industry to distribute the vaccines by air as quickly as they possibly can, um, were closing the doors to those airlines um, at very short notice without much regard for their businesses. Um, and I think we, we we struggle to to understand the need and the urgency of creating this travel this travel passport or this vaccine passport because until it is there you know it's very clear from what the um, Australian government was saying this week they don't expect to see any international travel before the end of 2021 um, unless there is a major breakthrough and you know. I don't see and I don't hear of that happening soon. Yeah. So we talked this the, the you know the last six months of doing webinars, we talked quite a lot about bubbles and corridors and, and such things, lots of phrases used for that. You know, I think we're going to see the continuation of that, but but probably not with any more efficacy than we've seen previously. You know, bubbles and talk of bubbles have come and gone and hasn't really made a difference, has it? And I'm, it feels like we need a, a a bigger initiative than than these sort of bilateral bubbles to actually yeah. make a difference. Well, bubbles bubbles have burst before they've even been um, realised. Corridors have collapsed before mm. anyone flown. You know, it's it's a huge amount of effort, um, and on many occasions, it's for a piece of political soundbite or expediency rather than actual um, well thought through reality and. Putting all of our attention and effort into these is just a distraction to which is the to the core issue, which is creating that global passport. Yeah. So we've talked before a lot about who uh, we think will travel when um, when we are able to travel. Where's the market going to come back first? Um, and is there some sort of pent up demand for travel? Our survey uh, responses came back with yes, there's some pent up uh, demand for travel, but not, not significant. Um, a certain proportion of business travel, 10, 20, 30 percent maybe, may never return to the skies, uh, which has huge implications for the airlines because that's that's the lucrative part of the market for them. Um, and, and at the time of the survey, our respondents felt that younger people were the ones who were more likely to come back um, as travellers sooner because they're perhaps a bit 
more prepared to take risks, less concerned about getting COVID. But we're, we're seeing a little bit of evidence now that maybe maybe it's older people, maybe it's um, those who've had the vaccine uh, first who who feel like well they can travel now. I, so a lot yeah, of I, different I, things. I think there's there certainly right? a, a demographic group who are you know expecting to receive a vaccine by perhaps the end of the first quarter, middle of the second quarter. Um, have been locked down for 12 months, have a reasonable disposable income, and you know their kids have denested, and they are going to do the trip of a lifetime wherever it happens to be too. Um, and and that was not what we expected to see um, at the height of the crisis in the summer of 2020. I think you know the other side of this is Becca, and it, it's very important to understand is that from the business perspective, companies have got a duty of care uh, and they need to be very careful about not only their travel budgets, but the welfare of their employees. So it's unlikely we're gonna see any dramatic return to uh, business traffic in any great volume, I think, before the last quarter of this year. Um, and even then that could be compromised because we should be expecting the major trade fairs uh, and the major exhibitions that normally take place in the last quarter of this year to be thinking very hard about whether they will um, host those events. Uh, yeah, they're they September, October, November, aren't they? Yeah, and you know, now is the, is the time when they begin to ramp up their planning uh, and they make commitments to uh, hotel rooms and to exhibition spaces. Um, and you know, there's a lot of work there and they can't afford to lose any more cash either. So it's, um, it's things are conspiring against us at the moment. Um, I, I think going to the, the the travelers, the leisure side as well. They, you know, if you're a tourism destination, trying to ramp, you know, if you don't at this point in the year know whether your the tourists you have, which will be fewer than normal, are going to be older or younger, with their very different sort of profiles of of travel and what they want on holiday. Um, that's that's quite a challenge, isn't it? Planning for that. Uh, completely, completely. Yeah, on, on the on, on the business travel side, I, I suspect that when if a business finds out that its competitor has gone to see their client, that's going to start opening up the travel corridors for businesses to actually go face to face with their clients and and pick up the travel. And I think they'll there will that will be a stimulus when when people start to move um, for the intra company travel. Now that we have video conferencing and everyone's a bit more familiar with with that process, that might mean it takes a bit longer to uh, to, to build up that business travel. So yeah, I mean, I quite agree with the the figures that you know there will be some reduction in business trips, but I suspect some of it will bounce back quickly when when people get that uh, competitive edge back. Yes. Assuming, of course, they're allowed to travel. <laughs> Yes, yeah, all that, yeah, everything depends on, on that. Okay, let's move over to uh, talk about airline performance. Um, I started off by saying, you know, this is going to be another tough year. Um, we know that airlines on the whole are going to be still burning cash through a good chunk of 2021. Uh, they've got high debt servicing costs. Um, uh, we've started to see the first fourth quarter results come in. Delta last week reported a loss of 755 million for the fourth quarter. Um, we've seen results from China where, you know, we've been reporting capacity numbers which have looked fairly good because there's so much uh, domestic market, but actually the traffic numbers are, 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 are well down for 2020. Um, just this week, we've seen Thai Air Asia furlough 75% of staff, so all part of the cost reductions that need to take place. And as John mentioned earlier, places like Australia potentially have an international lockdown through to the end of the year. So a, a very tough year. But I, I think, Sid, we were talking earlier and you were saying, you know, if we look at the Delta Airlines, actually, again, there's a bit, there's, that, just looking at the size of the loss doesn't tell the whole story, does it? True, true. I mean, Delta is kind of a standout performer, right? I mean, if if you uh, if you look at the full year uh, loss, that's that's even more alarming. Uh, and uh, but that that's that's not the story. Uh, that's not the only story, right? Uh, what we are trying to understand is uh, uh, when when the crisis first emerged, uh, what what uh, what the airline has done since then. And uh, from from that perspective, if you look at uh, 
uh, for an airline um, uh, the size of Delta, the uh, the reduction it has managed. Uh, with its cash burn and uh, it has been uh, compared to some of its other US peers, it has been very prudent at uh, uh, just uh, how it has managed capacity and responded to demand. And uh, it's it's obviously it's been one of the fortunate ones. Um, uh, and as as most of the US uh, uh, and uh, many of the developed market airlines have, in the sense that uh, they've uh, got a lot of support from the governments which uh, we'll, we'll see in some detail in subsequent slides. But but yeah, a combination of this uh, factors and and uh, the steps that uh, uh, some of these airlines, in particular Delta, has taken to, to reduce uh, or adjust their business uh, to the new conditions has, has been quite encouraging. And uh, even uh, uh, their, their balance sheet uh, before 2020, uh, kind of uh, as as they entered into uh, the crisis, uh, it 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 gave them strength uh, to to raise a lot more capital than some of the other airlines have managed to do. So so there is there are multiple stories, but obviously uh, they they were expecting uh, to return to cash positive at end of uh, uh, 2020, but uh, that hasn't happened. So that just shows what we've been covering uh, so far that the market is very volatile and. It's 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 difficult to uh, ac uh, to make any uh, uh, accurate or any any kind of uh, uh, confirmed plans. So so uh, if, until that happens, airlines will need uh, need to ensure that they have enough uh, resources to 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 manage this uh, volatile environment. Becca, I've I've never I've never heard anyone sound so optimistic about a 755 million. I know, I know. <laughs> um, so, but it, do you think but, that they'll, they'll be cash positive before too long then? Well, yeah, hopefully they will. I mean, there are some very interesting other takeaways on this slide. You know, I mean, um, long haul low cost, it's gone. Um, cannot see that coming back, um, either in Europe or indeed in Asia. Uh, very, very difficult. The the business model um, with all of the new requirements and uh, all of the concerns and competitive pressures from, from legacy carriers who are selling extremely seat, cheap seats makes that very difficult. Um, Thailand, it's not just Thai Air Asia. You know, there is a fundamental structural problem in Thailand with their national carriers. Um, they are struggling and you know, in normal circumstances would not survive. Uh, the national airline um, is overburdened with expensive management um, and low productivity and was before this event happened. Uh, and this, you know, this is just putting it in that downward spiral. Um, and uh, in Australia, I, you know, I go back to something Alan Joyce was saying, um, it's likely that there is only enough room in the market for two domestic carriers, so something will have to give there, and and that tough year ahead is probably going to result in us seeing more airlines um, failing to survive the first quarter of this year than than has been the case in many previous years. Yeah, yeah. So let's have a look at the the next quarter. We've pulled out some um, OEG capacity data for uh, the period to the end of March. Um, just for four selected airlines here in different parts of the world, but but they're fairly typical of what we're seeing with other other large carriers as well. So we've got Delta, China Southern, British Airways, and Emirates here. And again, as I, I said before, the yellow line is the is, is the capacity for this year. The black line is 2019, and the grey line is last year. So, John, I know what you're going to tell me that this Delta uh, capacity into March and the British Airways capacity. Mm -hmm into March, that, that's not going to happen, is it? Um, no, that's, that's just... your uh, cloud cuckoo land gap. Mm. Uh, that, that's just that's just not uh, realistic. Um, and indeed, if I was if I was an investor uh, in either of those airlines, I and I saw that data, I would be um, both concerned uh, because I don't think it is going to, you know, it, it should fly. But equally, if I look at the historic performance and the snapshot data in the OAG databases, we know that this is being taken out um, and everyone gets that email from an airline saying your schedule has been changed. Yeah, yeah. A bit more positivity perhaps in, in China, but uh, I think we're, 
we, we know that capacity has been taken out recently and uh, with the spring festival coming that maybe maybe we're not going to realize uh, capacity numbers that are higher than 2019 towards the end of March. No, that will that will soften as well, I think. And it, you know, in the case of Emirates, we we sort of go from where we are now, which is about 450,000 seats a week. At the moment, they're planning through to 600,000 uh, by the end of March. Um, I saw Emirates proudly announce uh, yesterday that they believe all of their A380s will be back flying by the end of the year. Um, I don't know whether so, so we've got a question about uh, what are airlines going to do with their fleet and are we going to see fewer wide bodies, which I, I suspect we would have expected. So I'm, um, that, that sounds very ambitious. Uh, yeah, uh, it does. Um, and, you know, credit to Emirates. They've been um, for many years a market leader, but uh, it's it's I think it's uh, going to be a hollow statement if we uh, look back at it at the end of the year. OK, um, I said at the beginning we were going to have a quick look at, um, at, at stock prices. Um, we don't normally look at this, but it's another way of looking at how the uh, market is viewing airlines. Um, we took here for a number of major airlines the share price on the 6th of January 2020 and then again at the 31st of December 2020 and just index one over the other to see which ones had risen over the year and which ones had fallen and it's interesting it's not surprising I guess that we see these green ones the low cost carriers more clustered um, with a, a share price that reflects confidence in the market, I guess, isn't it, John? They, they, if, if the market's going to be a bit more leisure in future, they're well positioned for that. If it's domestic and regional, they're well positioned for that. They typically went into this with a bit more cash. Um, they're a bit more agile. Um, this isn't isn't a surprise, is it, to see, to so, see them? Um, you know, stock prices are a sentiment on the future of the business rather than the history of the business. Um, and, you know, you're absolutely right, Becca. Those low-cost airlines are agile, fleet of foot, able to stimulate market recoveries very quickly, um, very um, very lean in their cost, um, and uh, ruthless uh, is the best way to describe them. Uh, and the investment market is looking for those types of characteristics at this moment in time. That's why you see at the right end, the end of the scale someone like Thai Airways, um, who you know, have just have just not smelt coffee um, and not responded, uh, and it's 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 really um, testimony to those airlines that have seen their their share price rise that they've managed their way through this crisis crisis better than their peers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some some of the issues there. I mean, the, the LCCs tend to have younger fleets anyway. I mean, they've they've ordered in bulk, so they've got them at good prices. They can then do sell and lease backs with those aircraft because they're attractive to the financing markets and they can raise their liquidity so they can put cash um, in, in their coffers. Um, they tend to fly narrow bodies rather than wide bodies and therefore they can benefit from that domestic and regional market like, like John said. And, and again, you know, they're flexible. They, they can route switch fairly quickly, whereas some of the bigger legacy carriers are, uh, don't have that that luxury and then they also have things like unions to play with and and other structures and infrastructure that that hampers their their ability to respond quickly uh, Eddie I yeah I agree with you 100 percent I think you know ultimately when we reflect back on this in three or four years time um, we will probably conclude that the airline industry was in need of some sort of shake up anyway um, it was growing too rapidly and we've sh we have shown some slides to that point in previous webinars. Um, market entry was very easy and it will, it's even easier now, uh, ironically. Um, and, you know, there was exponential growth, but it was profitless growth. Um, and too many airlines were generating revenue, but were not generating cash reserves. And oh, we've got a question along those lines from, from Bernard, is airline performance just a Darwinian shake-up, which I guess is what you're saying, but but he, he also adds, you know, is is there a rigged playing field, though, because of the support that some airlines have had that will, will somehow present uh, pre prevent that shake-up that's needed? Absolutely. Well, of course it will, and, you know, Bernard's, Bernard's nearly as old as we are, Becca, um, and he, <laughs> you know, he, 
he's asking a rhetorical question there because we all know that state aid to some of those carriers is um, is ongoing. Um, it, it stops them addressing some of the key issues they need to address. Um, and it's unfair on those around them that have had to take those steps, you know, and um, I guess you could you could point a finger at Virgin and say that they are one of those carriers that has been victimized in um, in a European context when you see what's happened to other airlines. Um, yeah. it, it's really tough. We've got a slide now on government support, so that leads in quite well. And this has um, come from Mishka, so thanks Eddie and, and Sid for, for the slide here and, and the next couple of slides we're gonna look at. Um, quite a lot of state aid has, has been given. Are we, are we going to see more now? Is there room for another tranche of state aid? Uh, I think there's going, to, <clears throat> there's going to have to be more. Um, I mean, I think so far we've counted, I mean, we've been tracking the state aid for some time now and we're at about 161 billion in total so far 156 carriers had, had asked for it out of 96 countries so it's only about half the, the countries of the world have, have sort of stepped up to that plate um, and there's another 15 billion in, in negotiation right now i think the us they recently cleared a second tranche didn't they at the end of the year for the payroll support program which is about 15 billion um but you know i mean recently we've had everywhere from from Bolivia to Tahiti and Egypt in between, um, you know, countries that are, are stepping up to the plate, you know, even in smaller amounts, but they recognize that they need to, to do something. Um, but these, these levels of support take airlines, I think, basically towards the end of March, after which I think the governments are hoping, you know, the vaccine will start to play its part and airlines can start, you know, stand on, on their own feet again. But, I mean, as far as those, as far as those, those bailouts are concerned i mean it's it's not free money um some of it has been in the form of equity in, injections as, as this chart shows you in some of the countries and i think about 24 countries have, have had those equity injections so you know that's that's been very useful but a lot of it 22 countries they've also offered loan guarantees now the thing about a loan is you have to pay it back so a lot of airlines are saddled up with a fair amount more debt than they used to have i mean they were fairly weak beforehand so They've now got more debt on their on their books as well. So it's it's not a it's it's not a a, a blanket free check. Um, it comes at a price, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that all the carriers that have had that will will survive either. I, Becca, I look I look at this chart and you know um, picture of the world, and it makes me think: are, as an industry, are we actually um, victims of our own protectionism? in the last 20 years because you know how different would it have been and how much more resilient would the industry have been if we had consolidated what is currently over 700 airlines operating globally into perhaps four or five mega global carriers um, with a series of perhaps 20 or 30 regional competitors um, you know it's it's no it's no accident that 50% of the airline industry's profitability in the last five years has come from the US carriers who consolidated um, and you know have cash reserves to hand. Um, if you applied that on a global basis, I just I just think we'd see a very different picture of the level of support that had to be um, required at this moment in time. Yeah, so I, I, I can't remember how many years ago it is, John, but but you and I worked on a study where we looked at other sectors um, where there was this sort of consolidation that happened and you end up with three regional players typically or three global players, this sort of, you know, factor of three. Um, we're a very long way from that, aren't we? We may have three alliances, but um, that's about as far as it goes. Yeah. Uh, how, how long, Eddie, before the airlines will be able to pay back all this money that they've borrowed? Is, 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 are they ever going to be able to do that? <laughs> that's a that's a tough question um well i guess first of all they need passengers they need revenue um and then they can start to think about it i mean as i think as sid mentioned earlier with 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 delta you know that they've they're sitting on a fair amount of of cash at the moment and if they can get back to a uh, an operating uh a, a profit they can start to pay back but i suspect a lot of other carriers 
I mean, a lot of these loans are the low interest rates, obviously. Um, mm. But I mean, it'll hang around for some time, I imagine. Um, yeah. I mean, that it just depends upon how quickly they can get back to a revenue stream that makes them profitable. Perhaps, perhaps they should consider it a bit like a student loan, something that never actually ever does get paid back. <laughs> So one of the questions we always get asked is, uh, is what airlines are we going to see go on? And in some ways, I'm surprised we've seen as few as we have. I know there's been quite quite a few, but perhaps I'd have expected more. Um, we've always enjoyed seeing this chart from you, um, Atishka, and, and you've updated it. Um, before we get to talking about the airlines in this red box, there, there are some more positive stories in here, aren't there? You've got airlines that have not moved um, into a worse position, but you've actually move them from high to moderate risk. Um, yes, absolutely. I think uh, because you mentioned about uh, why, why there haven't been that many uh, failures and uh, and we looked at that uh, and obviously a lot of that has been influenced by government support, uh, which has become kind of a key uh, determinant of credit risk in, 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 the, in the previous year. And uh, I mean, looking at some of the emerging market airlines, or uh, particularly uh, uh, Asian airlines, the challenge has uh, has always been, and even uh, kind of uh, heading into the crisis, was uh, was their uh, balance sheet and weak capital structure, and and that's where kind of uh, many of the uh, airlines, uh, if you look at the top uh, uh, top uh, tier. There's uh, there's a high degree of concentration uh, from uh, airlines from emerging markets. So um, uh, because of the losses that they've sustained and already coming into the the crisis uh, with a weak balance sheet uh, has further eroded their uh, their capital uh, capital structure. And uh, while some of them uh, uh, have managed to uh, get some support from from their uh, respective governments uh, or shareholders. A lot of them haven't. Uh, uh, where we've seen some positive movement uh, was uh, in terms of support from the shareholder. We can maybe talk about Cathay, which uh, having come off a, a difficult 2019, uh, initially we, we, we were quite uh, uh, skeptical or, or uh, uh, its, its risk levels had heightened significantly. And uh, but but thanks to that uh, uh, bailout uh, in the middle of uh, 2020 from from the shareholder and and the local uh, government that has kind of helped to uh, uh, alleviate some of the risk to some extent. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the the markets which have seen strong recovery, uh, Mexico kind of stands out. Indigo, uh, India and Indigo kind of stands out, uh, and uh, uh, there. Domestic traffic has has uh, recovered uh, to to quite an extent, and as such, uh, there have been some movements uh, from uh, from uh, top to bottom or from the top, uh, higher tier to the lower tiers as well. So so it's a combination, but it's it's important to highlight here that uh, uh, these airlines kind of uh, move around the boxes uh, all the time, and uh, we we track around 130 odd airlines uh, currently, and uh, what we are trying to understand is uh, a, uh, how much kind of balance, uh, how much cash it has on on, on the balance sheet, and uh, what's what's the uh, the restructuring measures uh, the airline has taken, and uh, whether it has capacity to raise more uh, capital. And uh, we we covered previously about about the volatile nature of the market. So um, uh, ju that just means that airlines' ability to generate revenues on a sustained basis will remain disrupted for uh, still for some time so um, uh, it, until until you have a sustained cash flow you'll need the support of uh, of a strong uh, balance sheet or a shareholder uh, that can that can help the airlines ride out the crisis but again uh, if if you if you look at uh, if i pick a few examples in asia pacific uh, like korean air uh, or uh, even asiana which uh, in which had a really difficult period uh, entering uh, 2020, but uh, thanks to its uh, strong uh, cargo performance and uh, and even they've, they've been uh, supported to quite an extent by uh, by the Korean government. Uh, this uh, their performance or operational performance was fairly uh, fairly encouraging. But 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 the story again that comes out uh, from from these uh, uh, cases is that it's it's been 
uh, on and off and some quarters like the second quarter was positive for some of these airlines but then the third quarter returned to uh, uh, to loss making uh, so so uh, so yeah it's um, as as we head into or as as we go further into the year um, uh, there would be implications on um, uh, business model because uh, uh, as we talked about earlier with the corporate travel segment and the international st- segment disrupted uh, more airlines even the legacy carriers will go after the uh, the traditional uh, the leisure segment or, or or the domestic segment and that just means more competition um, uh, for uh, even the lccs so there might be uh, there'll be sc- uh, scope for further consolidation additional restructuring there are i mean there is uh, each of these airlines can have uh, can be fitted in uh, an individual box by itself so 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 yeah i mean there is a lot uh, to talk about uh, for each yeah. of the airlines. Can I ask you, Sid, we've had a question about BA here. Where, where was BA? Um, uh, Becca, I answered it. Oh, have you? Okay. So, <laughs> so it, it, initially it was in, in the lowest tier and uh, again it comes down to uh, uh, balance sheet and uh, the airline has been consistently uh, profit making and it had a strong cash position but but yeah again BA's reliance on premium long haul traffic just means that uh, its its uh, its revenues will remain disrupted for a longer period than uh, some of its uh, other peers. And uh, but they they obviously they uh, they have uh, the strength of their balance sheet and they've been also able to access uh, recently access a loan from from the UK uh, sponsored by the UK uh, government. So so yeah, there is uh, they are taking steps, but it just means in the short term there will be some disruption. And what about these carriers up here then? Are we going to see any of these disappear imminently? Or uh, I speak as somebody who's worked for a couple of America, big American airlines, so I, I know that airlines are, and, and that was in the day when they were going through restructuring. So, you know, I know that airlines can emerge from restructuring and, and thrive. Um, but, but is that the case with these, or um, are yeah, you so any more about this group of airlines here? So many of these are currently restructuring. So uh, John mentioned about Thai previously, and it's again, it's it has got fundamental issues, but now there is an opportunity to address some of those issues. And the same goes for Malaysia. And uh, even if you look at Norwegian, uh, it's it's had a really uh, challenging three or four years. And and it, I mean, some of it is uh, kind of its own internal factors and its growth ambitious growth but uh, now again uh, it is uh, it is in that process whether it comes out it remains uh, it it depends on a number of factors but it seems to be uh, taking the right steps uh, but at this stage there's uh, uncertainty and until that process completes uh, with many of these airlines and i th- i think even with spicejet uh, there's um, uh, there's a lot of optimism with how they've uh, uh, managed uh, or uh, how how they've uh, especially with the cargo side uh, they they made up uh, significant gains uh, in the later half of 2020 but but it again comes down to balance sheet and that's that's kind of uh, a key from our perspective right okay we've got a couple more slides that you've uh, let us use today which is great and we we really appreciate it this one is aircraft values and then we've got one about lease rates um Quite interesting information. We're, we're clearly on the left. We've got narrow body uh, values, and on the right, wide body, and, and they're ten year old aircraft. So much steeper um, declines in in values here for the wide bodies. I guess that's not surprising, is it, Eddie? This is. Um... Yeah, I mean, I mean, the wide bodies were already in decline back in 2019, um, just because of overcapacity issues, and you know, the markets weren't performing as as people had anticipated, and, and production of wide bodies was was you know at a at a at sort of record levels so the decline had already started and, and continued through um through 2020 and on the narrow bodies it's a, probably a bit more evident you know when when all the aircraft were stood down in march you know the oversupply happened and it wasn't as if the aircraft were parked temporarily a lot of airlines realized that their their environment their their you know their playing field had changed and they started to right size and so some aircraft were stood down and therefore values fell in accordance with that and then there was a little bit of a leveling off as people hoped for the summer recovery uh, and as just been mentioned with quarter three the results were disappointing 
the markets haven't responded because of the way the pandemic evolved and so values carried on their slide um so you know it's been it's been a tough time for asset owners and if, i mean if we move on to the slide for the for the lease rates as well i mean with roughly half the aircraft today being being on lease um and of course airlines standing down uh, their, their leased aircraft as well um the lease rates have taken a sharp fall as well specifically on the on the narrow bodies more so um and despite the fact that you know it's the domestic markets regional markets which are performing well there is still over capacity in that space you know there are there are thousands of aircraft still on the ground and the airlines as they have no revenue um this you know they're struggling to pay their rentals so they've been asking for deferrals and various other schemes and just to try and help them through the whole process Less swords have been a little bit accommodating in that sense. Um, again, I was they've got. Say, are, they, are they sharing the pain a bit? There's, a, there's been a, you know, lots of sectors, a lot of discussion about, you know, every, each party sharing a bit of the pain rather than it all being felt in one area. Is that, is that what we're seeing with the lessors? Exactly, and of course, I mean, the lessors don't want to see the airlines go bust, particularly because that's that's their customer. So they've tried to find a middle ground, and one of the middle grounds has been. Um, you know, we can drop the rental on an interim basis or a short term basis or even give you things like power by the hour arrangements in exchange. We extend the lease on those aircraft you want to keep uh, or the aircraft that the lessors want them to keep as well. Um, and therefore, you maybe claw the money back, you know, at a later date. Um, so there's been some accommodation, but it's still been very, very tough. But what these prices do do is they create an opportunity for airlines you know, for existing airlines to maybe upgrade their older fleet so they can maybe stand down some of the older aircraft and lease some new ones at maybe the same rate or, you know, attractive rates. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a bit of that happening. Um, but also there's, there is, a, you know, there are startup airlines, airlines that are beginning, you know, to form, uh, they've got clean, cleaner balance sheets, you know, no legacy debt on board. And therefore, if they've got the right business plan, they could be attractive to a, a, a lot of the lessors as well who've got capacity that they want to place. Great. And, and where does this leave? You know, we, we know there's you know still new aircraft types that will be coming onto the market. And I'm thinking things like the um, 321XLR. Where where do those aircraft fit if if we've got so much capacity now? Is there we're still going to see markets for new aircraft types? Yeah, well, what we've seen happen with the with the order backlogs and airlines either cancelling orders or or, uh, or postponing orders is just to, again part of that right sizing element. But aircraft like the A321 XLR and and well any aircraft in production today is is the one that's going to be around in 20 years time. So they're financeable. It's what the, the lessors are interested in. It's what the financial markets are interested in, and therefore they're attractive and a lot of the capacity that's that's not appearing has been the, the growth capacity in terms of new deliveries. So there's still a re, there's still a replacement market out there, and airlines that had a plan to replace older aircraft with new are mm -hmm. still you know going down the, that line, and that's that's what's keeping the Airbuses and the Boeing's of the of the world afloat at the moment in terms of you know airlines <laughs> still need to take some new aircraft, and they are financeable. Really interesting. That, th thanks very much for that contribution. I know we've run just a couple of minutes over time, but it'd be quite good to take a, a couple of questions. We have been working our way through some of the questions as we've gone, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a good few more. We, we had a question about um, fares. What's, what's going to happen with average fares? Lot, lots of the things we've talked about have played into that in terms of demand and capacity mm -hmm. and where the airlines are. What, what's the view of you as a panel about where we're going to end up with fares? Uh, there are some super bargains to be had at the moment, um, and I can personally see that happening and rolling through for probably the next 18 months um, as airlines seek to generate cash as quickly as possible. Um, when when we plunged into COVID-19, we we didn't see a lot of activity in terms of average average fares coming down because you just couldn't stimulate demand. Um, so airlines took a quite a pragmatic view, but I think now what we're seeing is um, some some airlines being extremely creative um, in their marketing, trying to to get bookings back in from Q3 onwards, um, and you know not just 
um, in the economy cabins that there are some airlines who are putting some pretty attractive fares out there for their premium products um, because there will be people who want to revenge spend and, and want to be slightly more socially distanced on an aircraft. Uh, so I, I, I think the fares are going to be pretty sharp for a, quite some time. Um, the booking profiles are probably going to stay pretty similar as they have been in the last few months where most people are only, a lot of people are only booking maybe one or two months beforehand. But when we do begin to see a recovery, Becca, and people do start to book further out, then at that time, I think we'll also see the airlines begin to reintroduce some of the rules and regulations that they have waived in the last 12 months around leisure fares as they try to differentiate between the business and the leisure passenger. Uh, and are you, are you, what, what are we going to see in terms of cabin class? Um, we're going to see a bit more sort of premium economy? Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's an exciting development what we've seen with Emirates with their premium economy. That was already underway before COVID-19. You know, they've had to put that back a little bit, uh, but it's now on the uh, Heathrow route um, on some of their newer aircraft. So uh, I think premium economy will gain more traction. Um, the use of NDC, creation of ancillary revenues, uh, will be an important part of the success of the recovery for airlines. You know, they're not, airlines are not selling you a seat anymore. They're selling you uh, an opportunity to buy other things from them. Um, <laughs> some, of which, some of which you may not even realize you want. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's what's going to happen. Uh, they're going to be digital retailers um, and the seat is just one element in that. So a question in a, in a different vein, this will be the, the last one I'll, I'll take, and is uh, from Catherine. John, you mentioned a failure of leadership for the airline industry. Where should that leadership come from? And she, she acknowledges that maybe that's a, you know, a, a dissertation for a master's degree or something. But I think the same question you know, can be addressed to Eddie and Sid as well. We've, you know, seen actually quite a lot of government funding coming. So maybe we have seen, you know, maybe in the finance sector, we have seen some um, leadership from government. What, 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 what do you all think about where the leadership should have come from? Or what, what is, what's out there to be gained now? What leadership should be stepping forward? Well, I, I, for me, I mean, the frustrations that it takes, has taken some trade bodies a very long time to get to grips and to begin to lobby. Um, or even get recognition of their lobbying efforts um, is, is a major frustration. Um, the fact it took many weeks for ICAO to issue a series of guidelines about travel protocols for airports um, to apply, um, you know, that's the sort of thing, sadly, we can never completely plan, but that's the sort of thing you should have and you just dust down off a shelf. Um, any airline, any airline employee, you know, who's worked in a management team will tell you, they have an epic recovery manual for when something goes terribly wrong. Um, we didn't seem to have that as an industry um, and we, we missed that. And I think, you know, the, the unilateral steps of so many governments who um, probably with what they, th they felt was the best intent um, looked after their own um, market and their own country. Um, the subsequent destruction and confusion and um, emotional distress that it caused people to tr who are still trying to get home. There are 50,000 Australians who are still trying to get home at this moment in time um, and cannot um, get access uh, to a seat and um, an approval process. Um, so I, I just think, you know, we probably, we probably were naive to think that everything would continue to be as good as it has been for the last 10 or 15 years um, and just missed the planning opportunities we should have taken. Eddie, do you have anything more to, to say on the leadership? You know, you come at the industry from quite a different perspective, but it's... Um... I mean, as an observer of, of how the markets responded, I mean, I, I just echo John's points, really. It's, you know, it was every man for himself. So you had 181 countries or whatever it is mm. with the 181 different answers. And that's not going to satisfy a business that is you know international in the way aviation is so we've we're having to claw our way back from that and there are still lots to be done before we actually have that 
that, that uniform approach to this. Um, I'm hoping it comes sooner rather than later. I, Becca, I, you know, my, my final thought is I despair of a country that after 10 months puts together a travel recovery action group and fails to have anyone from the travel industry represented in that action group. I, th I think we know which country you're talking about, John. <laughs> um, with that, I think we'll draw the webinar to a close. Thank you uh, very much to my panel, to John, to Eddie, to Sid for joining us today and for the content you contributed. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be back on uh, February the 17th with the next webinar. Um, in the meantime, do sign up to REG's blog. Um, you can see regular updates with some of the data we provided today on uh, the OEG COVID-19 page. And John is now doing podcasts. If you um, uh, want to hear more of his uh, dulcet tones, the next podcast is with Soon Hua Wong, who's the chair at uh, PATA, the Pacific Asia Travel Association. So uh, do sign up to listen to his podcasts. Um, once again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, panel. Um, and we'll hear from you next uh, next month thank you thank you thank you thank you